Okay, so uh, this talk will primarily deal with how we understand or how should we best approach um, and dissect this notion of corruption. Um, um, and I think that, you know, recent testimony um, from the Zondo Commission raises three important questions. The first one is the all important one, um, which is, you know, why is it um, that after 26 years or 27 years, um, democratic South Africa, uh, with all its appropriate laws, um, its institutions, civic culture and glorious human rights activism, why has it failed to curb this problem of corruption? Right, and I think that maybe, in um, um, simple terms, we can say we can ask why is it that corruption um, has become endemic? The second question um, that I think that it does ask is um, linked to this: is that why have successive uh, free and fair elections? Um, we've had about six general and five. Um, uh, local elections, why have elected lawmakers, um, pardon me, why have successive free and fair elections elected lawmakers to power who have been reluctant to respond to the fundamental challenges facing the society? Right. And the third question that um, um, uh, the current climate has asked is linked to this, is that why have voters often failed um, uh, to remove or to punish uh, these respective incumbents. Now, these questions are puzzling because democracy and its accompanying electoral competition should, in principle, allow voters to select um, politicians who will curb corruption um, and bad behavior and to replace with those who do not. Yet empirically, this is often not the case. Um, my lecture will basically examine the conditions under which democracy can fail to secure clean government um, <clears throat> in the interest of the people. Using the case study of the ANC, um, my argument is that party system competitiveness, which shapes the effectiveness of um, uh, of the elections as tools to select and control politicians plays a crucial role in conditioning the scope of government corruption. I conceive corruption as a classical principal agent problem um, that can arise between uh, voters who are the ultimate democratic principle and politicians, uh, their agents. The magnitude of this agency problem is conditioned by the information available to voters about their politicians and the effectiveness of their electoral choices in controlling those um, um, uh, that they elect. Informed voters who can coordinate on credible alternatives um, uh, to incumbents that permit uh, or engage in corruption can select better types of politicians and hold accountable those who turn out to be bad types. Party system competitiveness influences the scope for corruption because it shapes both the information and the effectiveness of the choices available to voters. By focusing on these two critical, um, shall we call them mechanisms, I hope to clarify conceptually how party system competitiveness is shaped by governing party dominance in South Africa and how this affects government corruption. My main argument, therefore, is that competitiveness can be expected to reduce the latitude for corruption. Um, in this context, my lecture is divided into three sections. Um, in the first section, um, I'll make some general observations um, about the ANC, which is the main accused, um, uh, and this problem of corruption. Right. Second, 
I attempt to make the extent of the unprecedented scale of corruption in this country thinkable, right? Um, and I do so by providing um, some sort of general explanation um, of the character of corruption. Um, and the third is that I put forward um, some very uh, basic solutions. Now, when we look at our current context, I think that we can sort of make some five general observations. And the first one is that corruption in this country is not simply or shouldn't simply be conceived as a moral or as a criminal issue. But more importantly, it is primarily political. Now what do I mean by this? In the formal economic sectors that are dominated by established businesses, um, um, established corporations, opportunities are few, demand is high, and competition is fierce. In this context, the state has become the location for jobs, for revenue, for contracts, for tenders, and for licensing. The most important revenue stream, therefore, and lifeblood of the governing party to maintain power is access and control of the state. Right? Incumbency, therefore, is its main um, advantage, and it has used this to maximum advantage. One of the problems in, uh, in this regard has been the inability of parties of, um, uh, of opposition to respond in a meaningful way to this dilemma. The second observation is that corruption is the point where patronage and um, factionalism intersect. And this has given rise to a pervasive informal political system that is shaped by that intersection between patronage and factionalism, um, where patronage networks form factions in order to gain power in the state. While patronage and factionism are a feature of all politics, um, uh, this country's manifestation is akin to a spoil system, right? Um, uh, which is a, a practice in which um, a party, after winning an election, gives government civil service jobs to its supporters, to its friends, to its relatives, um, as a reward for working towards victory. Um, and as um, uh, and as an incentive um, to um, to keep the third observation is that just as we understand corruption as not only about bad morals or um, um, or weak law enforcement, um, anti-corruption is also not simply a technical uh, matter of restoring um, professionalism, um, enforcing procedure and implementing the law, it too is characterized by politics, right? That is um, um, the specific configurations um, uh, of certain groupings, um, of certain uh, counterfactions um, that support and mobilize anti-corruption campaigns in order to pursue uh, multiple goals um, uh, and multiple um, um, uh, 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 genders. My fourth observation is that Ramaphosa's presidency and its attempt to fight corruption will be determined by the internal politics of his ruling coalition, right? Especially or in particular, the competing interests of two notable um, uh, ANC. Um, uh, barons. Ramaphosa's coalition includes questionable politicians, and in the process of getting to power, they had to make alliances with some members of the very problematic patronage uh, system that they fought to dismantle. Meaning, in the uh, in the final uh, analysis, um. Uh, David Mabuza was the price um, of the presidency. Therefore, while the impression 
is that they are given a free hand to fight issues of corruption, incompetence, etc. This comes with conditions. Um, and the question is whether they'll be able to live with them. My fifth observation is that the emerging multipolar international system, characterized by the increasing significance of China and Russia, will provide constraints on and determine the future of um, um, Ramaphosa's presidency. And why this is so is because South Africa is an important strategic piece of China's Africa puzzle. And this means that China has an interest on who is in charge in South Africa and the leverage that that respective grouping can give it on the continent. Interference in domestic politics is a common practice in international relations, especially in asymmetrical relationships. Right. So the next question I think that's important um, in this regard is how did we get here? Right. Um, and in uh, particular, how can we make um, this notion of corruption thinkable? Now, most explanations of corruption in this country um, tend to look at the individual characteristics of actors involved in corruption. Right. So journalists, for instance, love to stress the um, uh, the individual moral propensity to get involved in illegal, um, uh, in illegal behavior and consider the individual, uh, the individual interests or the need for things like money or protection, right? So, so often the news goes, it is about Jacob Zuma and whether you charge Jacob Zuma or not charge Jacob Zuma, or it's about the personal interest of his family, um, or it's about the Guptas or any other um, patron and how they use the ANC to, uh, to build their empire. Um, or it is about different factions or groupings in the ANC. The term that we often hear is tenderpreneurs, et cetera. There is, however, very little analysis on the structural and the institutional features of South Africa's democracy in particular, its dominant party system and how it creates conditions for the development of corruption. Right. And so what I will do is that I move from this position and I will do two things from now on. The first thing is that I will provide context, right? Um, and most important thing here is that I will discuss how and why corruption is more pronounced in certain types of democracies, that is in certain types of dominant party systems in general, and how these systems blunt the threat of electoral punishment, right? Which obviously then the sort of spin-off from that is that parties then maintain an office and that changes the way in which voters perceive them, right? And then obviously um, uh, in, um, Doing so, I will discuss the ways in which um, it has uh, manifested in this country. Now, the concept of dominant party systems um, or of a dominant party system, if you like, captures a situation um, in which multiple parties exist, but the existence of this range um, um, of, uh, um, of choices has, for various reasons, little or of no consequence. As a result, the opportunities for other forces to win or lose power through elections are reduced. The democracies of, say, Italy, Japan, um, where one party dominated uh, the country's politics throughout most of the post-war period, um, by virtue of its majority status or as a plurality party controlling the parliamentary pivot, as well as many African democracies, such as South Africa, such as Botswana and Namibia, um, which feature multi-party elections, um, but no changes in uh, um, government are a case in point. Dominant party systems 
um, are defined by the protracted and dominant position of a party or coalition in government. And their origins typically lie in a combination of voter cleavages um, and the competitive strategies um, uh, adopted by parties. The exceptionally high prevalence of such systems, um, mainly in post-colonial developing countries, is often traced to um, those types of voter loyalties commanded by parties that led independence or that led democratization, such as the ANC here, um, or the United uh, National Malay Organization in Malaysia, um, or, uh, or PRI in Mexico. Um, but it also appears um, at the same time to reflect the use of patronage by governing parties to undermine the incentives for opposition politicians to coalesce and form an effective electoral um, uh, um, opposition. In much of Europe, um, dominant party systems are similarly based on voter cleavages, as well as parties' competition strategies, um, and tend to arise when a party uh, successfully positions itself ideologically as the core party, which implies its um, membership in all possible coalitions. Um, a good example is in the Netherlands, for example, um, with the, I think it's called the Christian Democratic Appeal. Um, uh, in Italy, for example, uh, the Christian Democrats held core, um, uh, core party status from about, I think, 1946 to 92. Now, dominant parties are problematic for two main reasons. The first one is that they create incentives for other coalitionable parties to collude with it. Because entering government requires them to enter into a coalition with the dominant party. Thus, all strategy is in the first instance interpreted in relation to the dominant party. But in Italy, for example, the long era of dominance um, by the Christian Democrats was accompanied by a strong tendency towards inter-party collusion, right? Um, and collusion here was typically reinforced by agreements that gave the other parties a stake in tolerating corruption by the dominant party. For instance, through the fixed distribution of public contracts um, among firms, based on the color of their political protection. Collusion in this case will always affect the capacity of voters to control their politicians because it compromises or shapes the flow of information and thus their ability to distinguish between clean and corrupt types of politicians and to punish corrupt ones, right? Um, the second problem is that the mechanisms by which dominance emerges, whether it's to do with, say, um, the positioning of a party or the positioning of a certain coalition in the ideological core of the party system, or in your more kind of like negative cases, the use of patronage and um, things like, um, uh, what's it, clientelism, limits the effectiveness of voter choice. In Southern Africa, for instance, Dominance is often achieved by incumbents who deliberately use patronage to enhance the coordination problems for opposition uh, parties in mounting an electoral challenge. Right. And so while they may not rig the vote, right? So if you look at a case like Zimbabwe, for example, they will deliberately rig the vote. Um, in this country, they will create an, in, uh, um, an environment in which the playing fields are always uneven. And, and while that may not happen during an election campaign time, for example, it is that the system design is that at all points, Monday to Friday, um, January to December, year in, year out, the ANC is always at a strategic advantage. Right. Um, and so 
in this country, for example, we also see it through the ways in which um, uh, the government party will use state owned enterprises on the one hand, the police service on the other hand, um, teacher unions on the other hand, um, together with the secret service, right? Um, in Japan, you had the heavy reliance of the Liberal Democratic Party on clientelism in the context of a fiscally centralized government um, uh, um, structure. Um, and that had the effect in fostering opposition party failure and reducing the probability that opposition parties would successfully challenge the clientelist regime. Similarly, dominant parties um, are insulated to a large degree from the effect of electoral punishment by their ideological position, right? By being sort of chameleon-like, um, which tends to secure their inclusion um, in uh, governments, even if they are reduced in um, uh, size, right? I think that this is happened in Malaysia. Thus, the mechanisms that can rise to dominant party systems can be expected to blunt the threat of electoral punishment. For these reasons, I think that we anticipate um, that patterns of dominance um, will correlate with higher levels of corruption. From a theoretical perspective, the mechanisms which limit successful challenges to help maintain collusive opportunities for office holders of the established, uh, established party. The examples of South Africa and Italy, um, together with uh, Mexico, India, uh, I think India after independence um, and maybe up until the 1980s, um, sub support these. And therefore, we can expect, therefore, that from a contextual point of view, right, um, uh, is that dominant party systems contribute to the wide, to widespread corruption through the abuse of state. We're not saying that other democracies don't have corruption or it doesn't happen elsewhere. But the reason why it becomes unprecedented and the reason why it becomes endemic is because of the character of that um, uh, um, of that dominance, and so therefore we expect that corruption is more pronounced in a dominant party system. The point being that it is this systemic feature of Savica's party system that conditions competitiveness by shaping the quality of information and the quality of the effectiveness of the choices available to voters. And so therefore, to the extent that the party system reduces the flow of information, or to the extent that it restricts the ability of the electorate to make effective electoral choices and coordinate on opposition alternatives, it broadens the scope of corruption. And I think that that is the sort of first um, um, uh, um, major observation. Now, if we move on to the more specific observations, I think that we, and based on the argument before, I think that we can sort of conclude that, pardon me, that corruption, therefore, is um, sensitive to environment, to, it says of two environmental conditions, um, um, in the sense that you know, in the sense that it's less about the law per se, but more about the political context, right? But it also, at the same time, affects those same conditions. And so, in a long series of interactions, corruption and party characteristics influence each other, bringing about multiple vicious circles. Um, what economists would call um, the high corruption uh, equilibria. Now, research on uh, research on political parties um, indicates 
a change in the relationship between different circles of participants, right? From uh, uh, party voters to members to activists to leaders. In democracies, corruption is linked more and more to oligarchic parties or oligarchism, a declining membership base for parties, the reduced roles for um, uh, and for activists, and professionalized uh, leadership. In South Africa, therefore, I am suggesting that the ANC has become an oligarchic party. And that in the first instance is that um, corruption in the ANC has been favored by an unstable membership base. Now, one observation that I have made, or an observation that I've made on the ANC since 1994, indicates that there's a considerable unstable membership base that peaks on the eve of elections and then drops between elections, right? And so party membership is akin to, um, um, for lack of a less crude word, to, uh, to voting cattle, right? Where various party barons, uh, um, oligarchs, etc., use as instruments in internal competition. Um, in this context, the party's activist base and culture has all but disappeared. The pessimistic, the pessimistic hypothesis um, by a famous political scientist called Robert Michels put forward at the beginning of the 20th century on the unavoidable bureaucratization um, of uh, parties, what he called the iron law of oligarchies seems helpful to account for developments in uh, um, uh, this country over 120 years uh, later. In particular, um, for the ANC, there have been important qualitative changes, such as a reduction in young members, for example, um, and the growth of opportunistic motivations. For the ANC, it has become more and more a machine, more and more a vehicle to pursue the agendas of party barons and clients. Not only are um, there no party members to voluntarily help with uh, things like um, um, campaigns, but there also are no party members who pay, who pay their dues on a regular basis. This means that the party has to buy in services, but it has no income or it has no projected income with which to do it. So unable to mobilize a stable constituency, lacking a stable membership base capable of paying for, uh, for party expenses. And thirdly, confronting a political class lacking ideological motivations um, who perhaps have become to see enrichment as the only selective incentive to uh, uh, to um, uh, to politics, um, ANC that thus has become more and more available for corrupt practices, right? And I think that obviously, once if one is to take a um, upon closer observation, it would be groups that compete with each other who are available to it. The seventh observation is that corruption has produced an alternative organizational structure, right? And so if we accept that corruption develops when parties lose activists, right? It in turn strengthens a process of oligarchization, if that is a um, word. So ideally, in any democracy, elected lawmakers must be capable of elaborating general programs, of convincing citizens of their benefits and putting them into practice. And so the rewards of this are often public, right? It's about appreciation, um, it's, about, uh, it's about power, um, um, and it's about prestige. 
and these should count more than material advantage. However, in South Africa, one party dominance has transformed the incentive structure of the, of the political class. Um, the institutional mechanism for selecting political and bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic personnel are altered in favor of individuals who are willing to invest in creating that influence, as opposed to those who see the rewards or who see providing the public with reward in exchange for appreciation, prestige, and power. And what this does, therefore, is that as a result, it loses its activist culture. Nobody is willing to contribute voluntarily, but they contribute in order to be admitted to the competition for position of private interests. And therefore, the final observation is that ANC, what we have therefore, is what we call a cartel party. Right. And so in a democracy, for example, political parties are meant to compete for voters and thus ensure the capacity of the citizens to control elected politicians. Right. Dominance and its maintenance transforms a governing party. Um, it is forced to replace their declining voluntary human resources, not with other activists, but with professional ones which means therefore that um, year in, year out, it fights just to stay in power and it designs programs, slogans, et cetera, for the interest of just being in power. So what are our solutions? Um, I think that, you know, and maybe this can be, you know, an important point of, discussion is that I tend to favor competition when it comes to how to solve a, a, a riddle like this. Um, and why am I a, 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 a proponent of it? So in general, competition introduces controls on party activities, and these controls jeopardize corruption. Right. And so significant institutionalized competition creates opportunities for forces to win or lose power through pu publicly visible processes. So a very wide range of issues can drive such competition. Um, but where corruption is a serious problem, opposition parties can raise it in such a way that voters can remove those in government who have abused their power. So party system competitiveness therefore impacts on the control of politicians because it structures and shapes the information and choices available to voters in controlling their competition. The problem with South Africa is that um, uh, the mechanism of the dominant party system has created a consensus amongst um, you know, voters, opposition parties, etc., that everything or every uh, political phenomenon that we think of is mediated through a narrative of our understanding of the ANC. And so nobody can think of any environment where the ANC is not present, which shapes how, how um, uh, voters respond to things like elections and all these things. It even shapes how journalists cover politics, how they cover parliament and all these things, right? And that has a huge impact on things like voter choice. And so while um, many, poor, uh, many poor areas, you may have protests over um, service delivery, over a variety of issues, um, there's never a translation of that sense of grievances to informing electoral choice, right? And this has a lot to do with the way in which um, um, uh, voter information is shaped, right? And so 
Um, the, my concluding point, therefore, is that when party system competitiveness enhances the information and the effectiveness of the choices available um, uh, to the electorate, um, the scope of corruption is reduced. Okay, um, I think that's the end of my uh, presentation. I'm not sure how much time um, how much time that it was, um, but I think that if uh, I'm not sure what um, we yeah, are, whether we can maybe just uh, take five minutes or ten minutes, um, uh, take a sort of short break, uh, and then we can come up with um, uh, our second session at from ten to two. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be we'll be back here at ten two. Related. Ten to yes. Okay. At one one fifty. Okay, great. Okay.
then they start creating and making deals to get to power. That's where it starts to come. Okay, Zuletu. I think we can start again, Zuletu. It's now 10 to. Okay, so um, we can open up for questions. Um, okay, I'm not William. sure how we should manage it, but yeah, okay. Okay, I can see I end. William, you have your hand up. Okay, it's it's Mari, not William. My husband paid for my course. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, I've got actually uh, two questions. I'm I'm fairly interested in political matters, but I'm quite a novice at it. 
Um, when you talk about competition being a way to um, lessen the possibility of corruptions, how much chance do you mean actually a strong political opposition? Because if you do, what chance is that of happening in South Africa where we have um, disparate um, opposition parties who really um, uh, don't have anything in common except that they um, attack the ANC? And then, so what, what chance is there of a strong competition? And the second question I would like to ask is, in view of the, the scandal around the um, corruption of the PPE distribution of team, and we now see an extremely critical distribution of vaccines, which has been on and off and on and off, and we see that that has been given to David Mabuza to oversee. Now, this seems to me an extremely cynical move on the part of, of um, Ramaphosa. And I'm not sure if this is caused by the faction, uh, uh, fact, the factions in the ANC, whether he has to be wary of um, the opposition factions, um, even in a matter as critical to the health of the nation as this. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, should I just uh, answer? I think maybe because because we because we have time. Um, I think on your first question, I do mean strong opposition, but I think that I don't mean it in the way in which perhaps um, some people may may perceive it. I see it more as the more you have um, um, the, the the more you have a diverse range of choice for um, for voters, um, the greater the chance that those people who are elected um, can be punished when they behave badly. And by that, I don't just mean being you know, voted out, I also mean uh, being held accountable. And, the, and what that does um, is that it changes the incentive structure of elected people, um, simply because there are consequences for actions which shapes what you do. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be corruption, but that the um, uh, the more um, the more range you have, um, uh, the better the chance. Um, and so yes, it it uh, um, does mean that. Most importantly, however, I think that if one then looks at the uh, South African case, I think that you are quite correct in the sense that. One of the reasons why, um, he, uh, you know, we have had, you know, just this, uh, you know, 20, 27 years or so. Um, and I mean, if one even looks at, say, uh, the character of presidents, right? So you had Mandela, you had Beke, you had Zuma, you had Motlante, then you had um, um, uh, Rama Posa, even though it appears that there was, you know, intensive fighting between all of them and that you had all these campaigns and whatnot, all of them come from the same stable and you can trace the histories in that, you know, what you have therefore is that you've got literally an oligarchy. It's the same people. And if even if you, you know, if you go further, is that they all are of the same age, pretty much. They're all getting older, right? And so the problem that we've had here is that opposition parties also in many ways, um, in my opinion, don't have the kind of incentive um, to make their role as meaningful as it, as it can be. Simply put, they are content with, benef with benefiting from the system in the way that they are, that they are doing. Um, and so if you compare to say, you know, opposition uh, um, um, uh, um, parties elsewhere and the way they talk to voters, the way they campaign, the way they shape information um, uh, is that we have a kind of, um, for lack of a better word, you do have cartelism creeping in within parties of opposition in the sense that for them, it's all really, it's all really about being in office. Um, and being in office means, you know, as, as long as you have a, a core base that gets into parliament, 
um, then that's fine. Your second question refers to uh, to uh, to David Mabuza, and I think that you know, um, uh, yes, yes, he is a problematic person. That's very very true. But I think that you know his importance goes further than that. Um, uh, his significance is that firstly he is part of the Ramaphosa coalition. That's true, right? Which means therefore that you know he's not necessarily. Um, the kind of outsider that people think that he is, right? The second thing is that he was instrumental in getting Ramaphosa into office. Um, and so I think that in terms of the configurations of the ANC, perhaps during this period now, right? So if we are say between what, 2019, which was the, which was, there was 2018, which was the ANC, uh, the ANC conference, then it was 20, uh, 2019, which was the general election. Uh, then COVID happens. And then we are in uh, another election year. Um, usually the trend is that those people who are in power will want to keep their coalition intact on the eve of an election. And I think that what's happened now is that we're also nearing the ANC's uh, National General Council, which means that any opportunity there was to reconfigure the problematic coalition that was formed in 2018 is gone. Um, which means that once again, Ramaphosa may need David Mabuza to get himself reelected. Um, and, and so uh, what that means is that you can't give him, you know, piecemeal jobs where you just wave and you know, I don't know, shake hands and whatnot. He has to also generate the kind of uh, the kind of public profile that will make his um, his role inside that coalition meaningful. Um, and so, and so, and so, um, my point, therefore, being that it is primarily about politics, which also confirms the point in the sense that you know it has got nothing to do with the way in which voters or with the way in which the public may perceive granting somebody like Mabuza such a heavy responsibility. It is all about what can we all do? How can we allocate roles, responsibilities, etc., in such a way that in our internal groupings, we can get ourselves elected back into power. And I think that, you know, we should um, maybe link to this though, is that, we should always remember that Ramaphosa was Zuma's vice president. That's the first thing, right? The second thing we must remember is that he also was um, a very, very important power broker in the ANC during those problematic Zuma years. And the only time that he breaks ranks with Zuma is when Zuma hires, pardon me, when, uh, when Zuma fires Ramaphosa's main henchman, which is uh, Praveen Gordon. Um, and that thirdly, is that Ramaphosa equally was instrumental in getting Mbeki kicked out of the ANC, pardon me, in, uh, 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 in enforcing Mbeki to resign. And so we are not looking, and so uh, the point here is that, you know, when we examine politicians who are part of that dominant cartel party, um, usually their incentives, usually their, uh, usually their motivations are in many ways tailored by the environment within which they operate. And here we're looking at, once again, one party that's been in power for, what, 27 years. Um, and that, you know, uh, what happens then is that it transforms the way that that party perceives public policy, the way which perceives public service. Um, uh, and, I, and, and I think that the less competition you have, the more the incentives of those who are in power, whether they are councillors to parliamentarians to, to even presidents who may in fact initially be um, well-meaning changes. It's about what do we need to do to make sure that the party remains in power? And in terms of that grouping, the argument is that what does our grouping need to be, need to do in order for us to get ourselves reelected? I hope I've answered your question.
I'm not sure whether I answered everything, but I hope I did. Yeah. Mm, thank you, jo thank you, uh, Zuleitu. There's another question from Monash. Monash, you want to voice your question? Monash, your hand is up. I think they're on. Um, uh, oh, they oh, huh. mute. oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm I'm a South African who left doing apartheid in the 70s. If I now live in the UK, I've been living a long time in the UK, but I keep a keen interest in South Africa uh, and I have family, so I'm a regular visitor. But what, what I just wanted to bring out some wider issues because I don't know if it's only the political system that's the problem, whether the, the bureaucracy also, the history of, uh, of clientelism, whether that existed even before the ANC came into power, whether there was attempt, whether corruption is inbuilt there as well, and also the civil society, because that's if people are, you know, if they're just able to engage in protests that don't get anywhere, which are almost self-defeating, they go for things which, you know, could benefit them, but uh, but they tend to burn down schools or police stations, whatever, uh, community centres. Um, but if there was a, you know, if there was a more vibe, a more equal um, distribution of power between politicians who control the state, where the state is very, very powerful, and the civil society, where that, whether that would make a, a bigger difference than having political competition, because even if you got political competition, you get another uh, party into power who will then also continue in the clientel client system. Um, so it's, I just wonder if it's a much more, if it's a fairly complex issue we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. I mean, I agree with you in the sense that it, it is a complex issue, and that and that um, um, I mean, and and that and that, and I think that you know the point that we're making here is that we are not saying that corruption doesn't exist in other systems. I think the point they want to make is that in terms of how it manifests in this system and in this society, what is um, not so much the single cause, but I think the point is, what is the most, uh, what is the most significant point in uh, the system as it exists today um, that has created an environment uh, that looks like this? I think that's the point that we're making. And so, um, um, and two, I think that if I look at um, civil society organizations, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, fascinating because I think that people are well aware of their rights, right? Um, you have a very, very strong activist base in civil society. You have a lot of NGOs, a lot of self-organizing happens. That's true. But what's fascinating is that people are very conservative when it comes to um, um, electoral behavior. So on the one hand, yes, it's, you know, it's a vibrant society. It's, um, you know, it's, um, um, it's young, it's modern, it's all these things. But when it comes to looking at politics, people are very, very, very conservative. And I think that, you know, um, it's not that uh, competition that is leveling the playing fields is going to be that magic wand that solves all the problems. No, but I think that in terms of its manifestation now, I believe at least, and maybe it's because I'm a political scientist, right? Um, that that is, the, or that is the first place or the most significant place to begin. For example, you know, um, things like, you know, the funding of, the funding of parties um, for 27 years, the private funding of parties was unregulated, which, which meant that the conditions to partake in corruption, which meant that the incentive structure of parliamentarians was clouded by this. And so, yes, I think that I do agree with you in a sense that when we're thinking about, you know, 
how to fix things in such a way that um, um, uh, you know, uh, um, um, uh, those people who are elected lawmakers may make the kind of decisions in the interest of everybody, right? And that we can share wealth in such a way that uh, makes a meaningful material contribution to everybody. I think that that point in the system um, where, it's in, where it's crucial to begin is in the political system. After all, law is made by people who are in turn elected. And so, um, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's not saying that those points are not important, but I think that the place to begin is in the politics. Hope I answered your question, Manesh. Yes, um, but I, th I think inequality is one of the, um, and, and, and that's growing in South Africa. It's, it's even worse than it was before in, in some respects. I think that also um, is, it is uh, I don't know if that, I mean, that's not much more difficult issue to fix, I agree. Um, but I think whilst that exists, whilst you have a very unequal society and the more society becomes unequal, that in itself is a, is a real problem for democracy. That is true. I agree with you. Um, um, and, I, and I think that even then, though, I still think that, you know, um, uh, you know, that, you know, uh, uh, poverty, inequality uh, in this country, at least, are not accidents. That's the first thing. And two, I also think that uh, the persistence of poverty and inequality is also not an accident. And I think that lawmakers do make um, conscious decisions as into what are the most important things. Um, and, those, uh, and those choices um, uh, are, you know, they are weighed up, they are discussed. You're quite correct. For the last 27 years, I don't know how many books have been written about poverty. Even the idea of a township, which in fact is an apartheid idea, still exists today. Year in, year out, yet elected lawmakers make conscious decisions to use tax money in certain ways and not in others. And so the point here is that if one is able to change the system in such a way that those lawmakers, their incentive structure um, is one that perhaps is not geared towards that, it might not solve the problem, but I think that it will go a long way to beginning to do so. And so, um, um, and so, yeah. So, 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 for me, I mean, like, I, I do, I do agree with you. But for me, I, I, I think that all of these issues that we sort of point out, lack of housing, etc., are not accidents. People make decisions around whether or not to prioritize that kind of housing and not others, whether to do so at all. And they are quite happy in pouring a lot of money and a lot of energy doing other things. Um, uh, but not those things that we perceive are the fundamental structural contradictions of our society. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Zuleto. There's a question from Tim. Yes. Tim. I think Tim, Tim is on mute. Uh, Tim has also got a chat. He's got mute, chat. I think. Tim, you are on mute. I think you better unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Tim, are you there? Well, he also put something in the chat. Maybe I should, while he's trying to unmute, shall I just read out what he wrote? Uh, there was no, there was no, uh, it was just a statement I made. I didn't want to ask a question. Okay, sure. Maybe you would just want to voice that comment. Tim? Yeah, well, I think, as I said in the chat there, you know, as long as it is so cheap and easy to form an ANC branch, which I think is 20 people at 100 rand uh, when I last read, so that's 2,000 rand to get a branch and a vote. So that's all you need to buy a vote, 2,000 rand, or correct me if I'm wrong, not much more. Uh, that gives you access to 
the kingmaker process that we saw at the last uh, ANC Electoral Congress, which actually allowed Mabuza to actually be the guy who elected Ramaphosa as president. And for that, I'm sure that Ramaphosa is going to have to pay. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I mean, I'll, maybe I should just respond to Tim. I mean, I think that, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, as the point that I raised earlier in the sense that, you know, you know, a, a you know, um, uh, you know, uh, once parties, I mean, once parties become cartel-like, then you no longer have an interest in your membership insofar as it will serve your electoral goals, right? Um, which means, therefore, that, you know, there's no in, the, which, 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 you know, it's, it's not in the interest to build uh, branches, if you like, that are meaningful, right? In the sense that, you know, you then have to account to people, you then have to do all these things. And so, you know, and as, as I said to you, is that, you know, the, you know, the one observation that I've made is that, you know, is that when one looks at things like, you know, membership, um, it's, it, you know, it goes like that, right? Uh, depending on whether it's an election year or not. And when you have, um, uh, when you have those years where there is an election, it spikes. And then between, it doesn't spike, et cetera, which, which sort of suggests sort of, uh, in many ways that, you know, people are in there, out, some of them, you know, some of them do exist, some of them, you know, uh, don't exist, et cetera. Um, and that the party is not about its membership, right? It, you know, uh, you know, those in power don't account um, uh, in ways where you do have a very sort of strong uh, um, um, as, um, as stable, um, uh, what's it, membership. Um, um, and that, that, you know, therefore, the uh, the uh, the interests of um, uh, of lawmakers is primarily to be in power, and you account to party barons and bosses, and that's what that's what dominant party systems do. They create systems like that. Um, So, like, I think you can maybe. I don't know who was first. And oh, there's a question from I'm Liz. Confused. Yes. Sorry, there's a question from Liz. Hi. Okay. Hi, Liz. Um, how's it? Uh, this is really fascinating to me. So, I sort of have have two questions, and it was one was around Parliament. Um, mm -hmm. So the. The in your in your uh, just the political power stuff. Just just. So Parliament is theoretically MPs are supposed to have constituencies, um, and and what I have noticed, say over the last ten years, say, like roughly two rounds of how um, MPs of any party don't have a constituency. There's no like constituency office, and in fact, some MPs even have a little tag which says. You know, I uh, doesn't belong to a constituency, and that's supposedly because they've been given some important uh, responsibility or something within the party. But the bottom line is, then you, if you're at the top of the party, you're now taking away any link that party members have with people on the ground. Um, you know, never mind branches of their own party, just generally. So I just wondered what that contributed. And then um, the second thing is the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. Is the DA doing the same thing? And what is happening in terms of the ANC in the Western Cape mm -hmm. and their inability to be an opposition party, or it seems mm -hmm. they seem to be losing in an yes. opposition way over the election. So just those, that's my question. Okay. Thanks. Okay, um, I think that with with regard to constituencies, I think that um, uh, the South African electoral system does have constituencies. They do, have, but it's only at a local level. All your wards, for instance, your ward is your um, that's your constituency, right? But the problem is that that's not translated to the national and provincial uh, ME elections, and so therefore the seat you have in a ward is not a pardon me the uh, 
um, uh, the seat that you'd have in, say, the uh, the city of Cape Town would be a ward, but the seat in Parliament isn't based on ward, and so there's that that yeah. that that issue. In terms of what it does, I mean, I think that you know um, there's a lot of uh, literature and a lot of writings around. Um, reforming our electoral system um, because people see it as you know as you um, as you uh, rightfully say in the sense that um, they uh, they remove that barrier or problems here they have this barrier between the MP and the the ordinary person right um, but I'm not sure whether the alternative that people argue for which is a constituency based system would solve the problem um, because I'm not sure whether in South Africa the lack of uh, um, uh, public parliamentary accountability is a feature of the electoral system design, right? Or it has to do with other stuff. And I think that um, it is, it definitely does play a role in that. But however, there are many proportional systems uh, in the world where you do have um, uh, members of the public that are able to hold their, their um, uh, lawmakers to account. Mm -hmm. I think that in the South African case, I think that the problem has got to do with um, an extraordinary amount of voter apathy in relation, I think, to once again, the party system design. People think that um, uh, it doesn't matter what I do because the, electro uh, the electoral contest outcome is going to be the same. So therefore, what is my incentive to go and vote? What's my incentive to even meet these people and all these things, right? And so you have a case here, I think, where, I mean, I think that we're even to the point whereby, it, you know, when we look at things like, um, um, uh, uh, what's it, uh, voter turnout, for instance, is that journalists tend to measure voter turnout based on how many people are on the books, as opposed to how many eligible voters we have. And if we were to measure turnout based on the amount of people who are eligible to vote, we are at like 30 something percent, right? Mm. Many, many young people simply do not have an interest in engaging in electoral politics, mainly because the perception is that it doesn't matter what I do, the result is going to be the same. And so that I think perhaps combined with some of the institutional features of a proportional system does produce the result that we have. Right. Um, um, sorry, I didn't get your second question. I was about to write it down, but I just totally <laughs> forgot it. The, D, the DNNC. Oh, yes, 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 yes. For, yes, yes. Which does, I think, in many ways link to that in the sense that the reason why the ANC falls apart in the Western Cape is precisely to do with the institutional problems that I pointed out in the sense that the more and more it no longer has a strong, stable membership base right? Once you lose power, that's it. Mm. It's lights out. That's it. Because there's nothing else. And so that, mm. I mean, so the Western Cape for me is, is a fascinating illustration of how hollow it is outside of the state. It's extraordinary. I mean, um, because you would think that with all the access to power in Pretoria, and you know the Eastern Cape and whatnot. That somehow there would be some way to create a leveling of the playing fields. In fact, most people in the Western Cape now, I won't say most, but a sizable chunk, do not have that relationship with the ANC that perhaps they did 20 years ago. And so, yes, the consequences of losing power. Um, and I think that the same thing happened in. Uh, Mexico, for example, with, uh, what is it, PRI, is that the point at which they lost power at a certain point, it just, everything just, you know, the humpty, 
was it Humpty Dumpty? Just um, and that and and that has a lot to do with this notion of unstable membership. Um, mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yes, that's true. Thank you. But I mean, Thank you. but 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 sorry. But the thing is that though is that you know um, the same thing in many ways could happen to a party like the DA in the Western Cape because the longer it stays into power, the longer it's comfortable nationally with just being an opposition party. It transforms its incentive structure. People don't mobilize anymore. People don't want to volunteer. And then slowly it just it just erodes. And that's what creates conditions for all these other parties like EFF. And you know, if you look at a place like you know Western Europe, et cetera, you know, you know, you have these like sort of far-right mad people, et cetera. That's what creates conditions for that. Yeah. Thank you. Fascinating. Okay. Just looking at any other hands. William, yes, do you please. have another question? Uh, sorry, um, your hand is still up. I've forgotten your name now. Uh, let me just see if there's anything in the chat. Tim has another comment. Tim, do you want to voice that comment instead of me reading, reading it out again? Okay, it's really a question from somebody from um, I can't see enough from uh, um, oh, yes, Mary. Uh, from Mary. Mary. Yeah. Um, yes, I was wondering if you could elaborate on um, what you mean by lack of information, because, you know, if you look, it seems like everybody in this country knows uh, knows what's going on with corruption. And it's not just a question of social class, because, of course, it's, you know, disillusionment about um, corruption, in the ANC that help um, fuel the rise of the EFF. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about what you mean by that. I don't think that people, um, I don't think that we should assume that people all have, people in the society as a whole, all have um, uh, the same uh, access to information. I don't think so. That's the, that's the, that's the, um, that's the first thing, right? And that, um, um, and that yes, you are quite right. There is a free press, and yes, you're also quite right that you've got, you know, you know, journalists a, 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 a blaze and all these things. But you know, um, but the the as a first point is that for me, I, I don't think that people all have the same level of access to information. Right, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, I think that even that information that is there. Right. So if I look at, you know, the host, I mean, I follow news all the time, you know, because my job, right, you know, follow all the stuff, you know, I, I even like, you know, access, it's extensive stuff. It's what I, and I think that if you read the narrative, um, um, you know, it, it, it all sort of makes the same basic assumptions in the sense that the assumption is that um, uh, uh, the, or the yeah, the assumption is that there is no alternative, right? And so all new story, even about the ANC, will portray the ANC as firstly the villain, secondly the mediator of the villain, and thirdly the savior, right? So if you look at even the last ten years, right? You know, Zuma was the villain. Right, Praveen Gordon was the mediator, and Ramaphosa is the savior. And the point here is that all these three people come from the same stable. It's not like they are, you know, somehow, you know, people who are, I don't know, come from, you know, one's from Mars and you know the other one is from Venus. They all come from the same political stable. There were times in their lives where they worked together. All of them did. And I think that the way in which um, um, uh, not just reporting them, but even if you look at things like some of the academic literature that's come over the last 15 years, all of them will make this basic assumption. And then thirdly, is that the way I think in which even um, activists or parties of, of um, uh, what is it, opposition, 
um, how they will interpret, how they will devise strategy and all these things is mediated by the ANC. I mean, one time I remember it was fascinating stuff where I forget her name now, but she was one of the was a DA youth leader marched to, to the house in order to protest against some public good or public demand. Then you have taxi associations who march to Lutuli House. Like, why are you marching to a party headquarters to demand public goods? You have even unions march to Lutuli House. And so you have this, and so the point, the third point is, is that, so therefore, they, you know, even with all of this, the way in which the narrative is, and the way in which the political culture is, is presumes in the first instance that, um, uh, you know, be it a villain or a hero, that the ANC is at the center of all politics. And that is how, and, 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 uh, and that's how we in, uh, interpret all the stuff. I mean, even just going to Robben Island, just, you know, I mean, I remember going there when I was much younger to much later. It's extraordinary how, even how people perceive of history, how you write history, presumes that this is the, once again, the old, what's it, the grand old, the grand old party that is, that was activist, that was judge, that was all, all in one. Um, and, um, uh, and I think that, you know, if one then looks at the way in which, you know, uh, uh, dominant parties maintain power is that they have an interest in controlling that narrative. And so when it comes to things like, for example, um, what is it, uh, an internal ANC primary, right? You will have media coverage forever. Like you will know all the intricacies of it. When it comes to media coverage of other organizations, one does not get that same level of exposure, for example, which shapes how people perceive the dominant party, which shapes how they act accordingly. And I think that that's the, that, that I think is the point that I made. And it's not so much about um, limiting information. I'm not sure whether I was quite clear. Oh, my God. Um, I think that my point was how it shapes the information, how you, how you structure it, um, in the sense that your lens is always limited by this reality. Um, and and you know and you can have the, the, and this has happened before though like you can see, you see it happening in Malaysia and Mexico and India is same thing I mean it's not there's no it's not a a um, unique thing yeah I hope I answered your question thanks that was an excellent response okay Paul has a question for Russell Paul would you like to voice your question <clears throat> yes thank you. Um, thank you very much for um, this lecture. I was, in my um, past, the director of the Anti-Corruption Commission in Zambia. And so I speak with a little bit of authority when it comes to this type of thing. But um, I get the impression from what you're saying that after the elections in South Africa this year, the status quo may still exist. If it is going to exist, Shouldn't we be looking perhaps as to see why the judiciary and the organs of the judiciary, you know, the investigating um, departments, the um, courts, seem to be failing in bringing people to book? The reason I ask this is that um, if there is voter apathy, and I can well understand that there may, white, uh, may well be, wouldn't this... Um, if it was possible to actually see people getting into court and actually being convicted in a reasonable time, help to send out the message that this corruption does not pay. I think people are looking to see this. And whilst I, I completely go along with everything you've said as to, in regard to what needs to be done in taking the problem of corruption at the level you're talking about, perhaps in the meantime, there might be more effort put in into getting people to vote. I, I, um, in many of these countries, uh, Singapore and other places where they weren't exactly democratic, 
but they certainly were successful in stopping corruption. Maybe you'd like to just um, comment a little bit. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that on the local election stuff, I mean, I think that, you know, for me, I think that, you know, the one thing about it that's just, I don't know, fascinating is that, you know, it is definitely an area where you have maybe the greater opportunity um, for a more com uh, for more competitive politics, but I think that the um, the character I suppose of opposition parties is not one, um, or the culture, if you like, is not one um, that is based on cooperation, right? So I think that the one person did make this point in that there are all these small little entities that pursue their own little content, which is why. You know we have predictable results year in year out, and I think that it think things won't uh, things won't change in that regard. I think that when it comes to uh, prosecutions, I agree with you in the sense that you know you know once once people see um, that kind of that kind of justice, it does send out a message. That's very very true, and I think it's 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 also true that um, it does shape the way in which people perceive politics in the sense that there are consequences for, you know, for what you do. I think the riddle, I think that I sort of, you know, cannot sort of get my bugbear around. And I think that you, I also do uh, agree with you, is that there does seem to be a lack of, uh, um, uh, uh, a lack of consequences um, for the actions of certain people. That's very true. Why that is the case, uh, given that there is um, an understanding, I think, that the judicial arm uh, is, you know, uh, uh, somewhat, uh, I suppose, independent. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I am not so sure that the prosecution arm um, uh, I must choose my words carefully, uh, whether it has been immune to politics. I'm not so sure about that. In the same way as, you know, um, I'm also equally not so sure that um, the South African Revenue Service, despite the fact that people perceive it as this you know, highly efficient machine, I'm not so sure also whether it has not become immune to politics. And I think that part of it, I think, has to do with the fact that the longer one party spends time in power, the longer its tenure in power, um, uh, the more vulnerable such institutions become for interference. And it's not something that will happen directly in the sense that I appoint somebody and they say, do not prosecute Paul because Paul is my friend, etc. But I think that over time, and here we're not looking at direct, we're looking at you know, junior people. Over time, such such institutions become vulnerable to politics, and so um, and so I think that you know it's not that a prosecutor is now somehow uh, uh, what is it implicated, right? But it's more of I no longer have a will to pursue senior people because that could affect my career prospects, as opposed to that person gave me a bribe. And so therefore, I think that it manifests as a kind of reluctance um, uh, because people fear the consequences of what, you know, what could happen to me, what could happen to my career if I pursue this. And so for me, I think that I, I agree with you, but I think that you know, why then people pursue somebody like Jacob Zuma, for instance, is because the costs of doing it are no longer high than they were before. And so, and, you know, you know, once again, this is a function, I think, of one party dominance. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I hope I answered your question, Paul. I'm not sure whether I, I, I did um, that. <clears throat> yes, you have, and I'm very grateful because um, the, exper the experiences and things you've said, I, I also experienced, and that's why I was quite happy eventually to be able to retire as the deputy director and become a normal person. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome.
Uh, William has a William Holdley has a hand up again, and then Liz. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten you. your name. Just tell me no, your name fine. again. Maury. Maury. Sorry, Maury. I'm so, uh, yeah, thank you for giving me a second chance. Um, first of all, your point about the impact of the media on the growth of opposition parties or on the information that's out there for people um, about opposition parties is very well taken. And I think the media is very lax in this matter. Um, then I wanted to ask you something. Um, the original title of this lecture was um, The Founding and Floundering of the ANC. I have no problem with that sort of focus changing. But I would like you to explain um, what kind of floundering you're talking about. Is it the party itself that's weakening within the country or is it a corrosion inside the party? And if it's the um, the former, in other words, it's weakening within the country and, and with the electorate. Um, what do you see as threats to its hegemony? What what would actually eventually sure. reach? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure. done. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Um, I think the foundering has to do with, you know, uh, you know, being at the tenure of a dominant uh, party system. Um, and I think that all dominant parties, and, 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 and I think that's the kind of message that I'm, I'm making, is that all dominant parties uh, have the seeds of their own destruction. All of them do. Um, and so, yes, it is an internal corrosion. That's very true. But it also is an external one in the sense that, I mean, you know, if, you know, for example, if one looks at the um, electoral outcomes of the ANC over... I think I could write this down somewhere. Over three elections, over three elections, right? I think that we sometimes tend to get too fixated on the percentage. Um, but if you look at the actual number of votes, it has remained stable for 15 years. For 15 years. The only reason why things shift has got to do with turnout relative to other parties, right? But the number has remained the same. And if we go further and we say, well, then if we say that um, the ANC's number of votes has always fluctuated between say 10 million and say 11 million, right? The peak being about 11.3 million, et cetera. And then we say the number of registered voters has increased to say 28 million. We're, we're, we're saying that in fact, the ANC has only been able to capture a third of the number of registered voters, right? If we increase that to the number of people of voting age, it's even smaller. This now ties into your second point, meaning what could change the hegemony, right? Mm -hmm. The point here is that you then therefore have got, I mean, if we look at the figures for last election, right? you had more people that did not show up to the election than those who voted for parties of opposition. More people. So forget now talking about people of voting age. That we can park for now. But just looking at people who are on the books, part of the Independent Electoral Commission, more people did not show up to the election who were on the books than the combined total of all parties of opposition. That for me says that people are A, apathetic, that's true, but B, there is also a sizable constituency in the whole electorate that wants something different, that could potentially make a different electoral choice. And so for me, I think that the one thing or the most important thing that could upset this hegemony is the vote. Simple as that. And that you do already have conditions in place. That is, people who are who want to go and vote but choose not to vote because they don't like the options that are put forward to them. I think for me, that's that's the main that's the main thing. And 
um, and 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 I think that it's more so in this country because I think that the way in which, say, if one compares dominance between, say, I don't know, ZANU PF on the one hand, and the ANC on the other hand, right? I think that ZANU PF will um, will rig and will rig, right? So they will say, you know, we we know that Harari is MDC, so we'll put three voting stations in Harari, but then we know that in, I don't know, for arguments like Gweru is, you know, ZANU PF, so we'll put 10 voting stations there, right? That's how they rig. Or Uganda, for instance, they're like, just stuff ballots. You know, just take whatever you want and shove them all in that box and you might so whatnot. The way the ANC does it here is that they don't do that. They don't rig an election, no. All you do is you, all you do is that you basically create an unfair playing advantage between elections. That's all you do. Whether it's through access to money, et cetera, that creates conditions whereby at the point of the electoral contest, you've won already, right? Because the whole system is geared towards you being the story all the time, which means therefore that the potential for change here is my opinion, obviously, right? Is greater and a lot not easier, but it is. Um, um, uh, there's. Uh, um, it's. It's the. Um, the outlook is more. Uh, is more positive than in a Zimbabwean case where you're dealing with an already. You know, the the army already manages elections, and the police, and party agents, and so changing that culture. My goodness, I don't know where you begin in that case. Whereas here, you already have in um, uh, place the kinds of practices that may make such a transformation easier and less violent. But what you also have here is that you've got ingrained perceptions that cannot think of any other alternative but that one party compared to Zimbabwe where people are just fed up. They have long had enough. And so that for me is the, is the, is the, um, you know, what could, you know, uh, what could do it. And you know, so who knows? I think that um, of the kind of research that we do, for example, is that we have found that um, the amount of trust that people have in parties over say the last 15 years has declined considerably. And so perhaps, the greater opportunity you could have, incidentally here, is that if one is to reform the electoral system in such a way that it agree, it's an agreement with the, uh, with the public, you might be able to create those conditions. Um, but yeah, that's where I see that, that change. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Liz, you have another question? Thanks, Liz? Yeah, hi, as long as there's no one else, because I'm having a second bite. Um, but this is really quite fun. So, so what, just following on from what the last uh, person said, it's almost yeah. what went to my mind is the emperor has no clothes. There's a narrative here, um, which a very successful uh, narrative from the ANC, that you have no other choice. So you just yes. rather don't vote. Um, and we stay in power. But but exactly. having said that, what I was thinking about is the external narrative in a sense, well, the other thing that's in the media is that there are certain elements of the ANC that are that are certain factions that are a problem being gradually addressed. And that's another narrative. But Given that you've, what you've raised is actually there is space for change, what is the narrative inside the ANC? Because that's what I'm, I'm you know, if 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 this, you are, you know, the corrupt factions, I know that, that that's that's not really an issue. But if certain factions are seen as worse mm -hmm. um, and therefore yes. should be thrown out in order to ensure that the ANC wins. Why doesn't it happen? Because the Integrity Commission of the ANC has got a list of people who have refused to step down, step out, whatever, who are implicated. Yes. 
and mm -hmm. none of that gets get you know nothing happens it just sits in a hiatus and and those same people remain in powerful positions so so even within the factionalism yeah. are they not aware of the fact they could be kind of cooking their own goose that's just a look yeah. yeah look maybe one one way to answer you is that you know you must remember that there was a time when um you know the ANC had a very strong um membership and organizational base and that was when you had a relatively strong, uh, what is it, Kosatu, right? And so if one was to look at, say, you know, the last 20 years or so, the, 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 uh, the one sort of, uh, the, the, the one organization that always gave the ANC a strong membership base, a strong sense of accountability, um, um, you know, and all those things were the unions, yeah. right? Um, and 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 yes, there was issues, and yes, there was fighting, etc. Yes, but they were all about the kind of things that were in the public interest, right? Mm. Economic policy, service delivery, you know, poverty, and all those things. And in fact, conferences you 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 had, I mean, like the amount of discussion, uh, what's it, uh, discussion documents between mm. Beki and Vavi and all. I mean, it was extraordinary. Whereby you know the conversation was actually meaningful and you had think tanks that would weigh in and, and all these things. And so, and I think that if one was to look at say, South Africa between 94 and say uh, 2007 or so, right? Mm -hmm. Is that one could argue that even though yes, there were problems, right? And even though yes, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, things weren't rosy for everybody, but that there was a strong foundation being built, even in fact across parties of opposition. I mean, you know, even though you know, you know, you know, I mean, like, you know, if 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 one looks at the amount of coalitions that were formed during mm. during uh, during that period between mm. different entities, you know, whether it was I don't know IFP or whatnot. I mean, you had an emergent collaborative, you know, culture. And yes, it was messy, and yes, it was floor crossing, and all these things, right? But mm -hmm. the point of the matter is that you could get a sense that there's a strong kind of foundation being built here, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was a kind of environment where the points that you make would have been relevant, in the sense that something doesn't just sit in an integrity committee. That didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. Now you don't have that anymore but the unions have imploded the governing party is literally you know a headless chicken as i said you know you can trace membership you know mm -hmm. and it, it's even by their own admission you know election time it peaks you know mm -hmm. between elections it drops considerably when there's an issue between one faction it increases and in fact you know there are times when their recorded the recorded membership doesn't add up at all I mean, even by their own admission, they'll say that most branches, they argue, are not in good standing, meaning they have no clue who their members are at all. Mm. Whereas before an election, all of a sudden they have a clue. It's at right. And so, um, you know, you know, you know, and so I, th I think th I, th I think that now the, the more and more a party loses its organizational base, the more it becomes a hollow shell the more the internal culture is one of, I don't have to account. The only people that I account to are those who are, what do I call it? Who are in my group. I mean, I don't know whether uh, you watched the Zondo Commission now where you, know, you had a case whereby the one minister facilitated the transfer of funds from the Secret Service to, I don't know, Zuma's mm -hmm. grouping, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, an extraordinary sum of money, right? Extraordinary sum of money. Um, and that very same minister was appointed in 2019 by Rama Posa, mm -hmm. knowing what this person did. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? And so, I mean, and so, and, and for me, quite frankly, I can't, you know, even in a dictatorship, right? You don't transfer billions of rands from a secret service. You don't do that. Yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, and so and so and so yes. Yeah, so that you know, when you have a culture that doesn't, that's not, that's no longer characterized by, you know, knowing what the reporting lines are, accounting yeah. to this, accounting offices, when that no longer is there. And I think that for many years, Corsatu provided that function for the ANC for many, many years. Um, mm. That no longer is an option. And so therefore it's become an empty shell uh, in many ways when you don't have that kind of organizational culture and discipline. And so, yes, it means that it leads to these kinds of, uh, the, these kinds of behaviors where, you know, um, a meeting is whether or not your general secretary who is in, who goes to court for corruption should resign. I mean, yeah, yeah, crazy. I mean, that's, you know, that's what you get, right? Um, but but I think that for me though, I think that it's still, I think for me, a, a kind of sy systemic problem as opposed to an individual one. I think that's the, that's the point that I make, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Liz. As later, there's one more question. Ma Marion Lovell has a hand up. Okay. Marion. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Fascinating lecture. I can see you're very passionate about your topic, and it's a, a pleasure to listen to you. <laughs> um, just a question about, um, is it unthinkable that the ANC could split? Um, I think a lot of people feel that that would be a really good thing for this country. And if it were to split, how would you see the political landscape uh, to be? Um, you know, we're full of unintended consequences in this country. And would a split bring the the improvement or the relief that we seek, or would we just land up in another quagmire altogether? And do you think that it would take away some of the voter apathy that we're experiencing? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, the ANC has split already three times, right? So it happened with the UDM in 1997. It happened with COPE in 2008 and eight and it happened with the EFF in 2012 right and so the one lesson about it is that party fragmentation in the in the uh South African context and I can, I'll also maybe uh talk about parties of opposition but with regard to the ANC party fragmentation um, has not led to any substantive changes, firstly, in the nature of politics, and secondly, in uh, voter uh, perception and voter behavior when it comes to you know, things like elections and whatnot, right? It, 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 it hasn't done that at all. I think that maybe the most significant of these was the EFF, um, largely because it was its former its former youth wing, or it was a big um, uh, uh, a big chunk of it. But I think that what party fragmentation has done in the ANC is that it has led to uh, the point that I talked about earlier on uh, um, more collusion from parties of opposition. Right. And so if one takes UDM, you take COP, check EFF, all of them would seek to play one faction against the other in the ANC for their interests. Right. And so what that says is that, you know, EFF in particular is that EFF therefore presents itself as a coalitionable party, but it literally colludes. It was with the DA initially, which I mean, like even though the two are I'm ideologically opposed, I would have thought that an EFFDA coalition makes sense in a down party system, but then obviously the moment you had a power shift in the ANC, the EFF shift. Once again, that point around uh, that point around collusion that are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are made. The same has happened, quite happened with, um, with the uh, DA, where it was first, what was first DP, then NNP, it then formed a coalition and then it became, um, you know, a DA and then there was a whole mess that happened, right? And I think that um, the DA and then, then the DA had, you know, other coalitions that happened um, in the city of Cape Town where there was a merger 
um, the problem of merger, ah, oh, coalition, and then uh, Dalil and ID, they merge, and then Dalil, you know, she left, right? But even then, that did not change the culture of parties of opposition. It didn't. And so I don't think, so to answer your question, I don't think that a break in the way in which, um, uh, in the way in, in this form is going to change anything, even if it does, right? It, I mean, pardon me, even, even if it does happen, it won't change anything. Um, I think that um, um, uh, what could, and, and, and that, and, 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 and I'm trying to get to my point, I think there are lessons to be learned, even though they are bad, they are bad um, politicians though, the lesson to be learned um, in, the, in the last five years in Western Europe, I think, who use the very same party system that we do, and um, especially, you know, Italy, Portugal, et cetera. Um, and, and I think that they are probably happened too, though, is that you had generalized voter apathy, and then you had the emergence of, you know, populist kind of, um, you know, uh, right-wing people, et cetera, who used that level of discontent that people have with the establishment. And so in my thinking is that the one thing that maybe the population here would welcome, I think, is something completely new um, as opposed to, uh, you know, old wine in new bottles. I think that for me is where the shift is, gonna, is the, the, the shift will happen. It won't be with regard to the current kind of uh, the current elite, all of them, ANC, you know, um, EFF wasn't the ANC, DA, you know, IFP, all of them are part of the establishment, basically. And I think that that's what people don't want. Um, uh, and I think that you what, what, what you may find is that there are lessons, though, I think, from the COPE moment in that the extent to which even journalists shifted their perceptions about writing, about you know how they write about uh, things like politics, that moved in 2008 for me, uh, sort of, and that was what 12 years ago, speaks volumes to um, you know what yeah, what is needed because COPE was presented as something fresh, something new, something different, something interesting, um, but obviously it began also to collude and then people just lost interest. Um, but I think that I think that for me, it would be uh, something along the lines of um, a very different type and style of politics uh, that is not, you know, um, um, old men in suits, um, you know, who drive, you know, who drive cars with bodyguards and blue lights and have this aura of self-importance. Um, and I think that if one looks at even in other parts of the of the um, continent, I think that there definitely is um, a lot of public appeal around having a kind of a you know younger group of a group of people who are anti-establishment. Um, in Uganda, for example, that guy, uh, what's his name again, uh, Bobby Wine. I mean, you know, fascinating. Um, uh, and, and more so the way in which people responded to him, I think for me. Um, and the same you had if when, um, I mean, I think that now he's sort of um, written himself into kind of like, you know, bad books. Uh, the president of uh, Ethiopia, you know, young person, et cetera. So there is, I think for, I think for me, that's where um, the, the um, opportunity is for the kind of change that you, uh, that you talk about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Zuleta. There's another question from Richard. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Marion, for posing the question. Richard, Marion, you can throw your hand. Okay. Thanks very much. It was most interesting. Tell me, in your opinion, what sort of political system could be best for this country? Um, look. I mean, I have a bias, and 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 I was, and that was really clear. That for me, I I I I think that the best and the most the most stable systems are the ones um, where people or ordinary people feel they have a stake in it, 
right? That that you know that it's not this kind of distant thing that's far out there, but that in fact it has some kind of meaningful. I don't know, like you know that, that you know I can you know that that it um um maybe the right word is that one that is more responsive to you know um, um, uh, uh, grievances, demands, and all these things, right? And I think that uh, those kind of systems are the ones that are more stable, obviously, one. And two, they're ones that sort of have, um, um, they are um, able to generate the kind of um, public support and public, uh, uh, and public sympathy uh, than those that are far away, right? Which means that, you know, very, very, you know, simple things that, you know, if I believe that the public is in fact public for all, then it, you know, has a huge impact on how I um, on how I relate to it, right? Um, and so, having said that in mind, I think that I it makes perfect sense why we had the proportional system. It makes sense because it was that time in the um, in the sort of uh, um, past where you wanted to, you know, uh, create an environment where all parties are able to, you know, make a meaningful contribution to, you know, to, to, write, to uh, write the constitution and all these things. I think that um, the problem that we have in this country is that many people feel that they don't have a stake in the system, that it's far away for them, that it is unresponsive to their basic kind of, you know, basic life. You know, if I have to wake up at three at three in the morning, you know, queue, take five taxis, my kids haven't even got up, et cetera. I'll feel like, you know, that this is the worst form of nonsense that life can throw me. And no matter what I say, there's no response at all. But yet, you know, the, uh, the general narrative that comes from those whom I vote for is that everything is fine, right? And so I think that for me, having said that, I think that for me, there has to be, as a basic requirement, some level or some degree of um, cons constituent accountability that forms the basis of the whole system, whereby parliament becomes this collection of different constituencies that come from all our different places where people are able to articulate their interests. It's, it's, you know, having said that though, it's not that I'm not aware of the problems of those uh, uh, of those kinds of systems, because, you know, all systems have got their, you know, you know, big issues with all these things. But however, in this society now, in terms of the problems that manifest in 2021, I think that some level of accountability or some level of constituency, I think, um, has to form as the cornerstone of how we redesign or reform our system, um, um, and I think that is so. So, so it's not to say that you know one is good or one is bad, but I think that it has to have some basic foundation. I think that that for me is it. And so, you know, how it will look like, obviously, um, will depend to a large extent um, on you know how we're able to uh, sort of make sure that we design it in such a way as it reflects the collective interests of all people, right? Um, um, and, and, and that's what I think for me is the, the best system. Um, I'm not sure whether I answer, answered your question, Richard, because I didn't name anything, but for me, that's how I think about this, this, uh, these, these, uh, these things. You know, now that's very interesting, but tell me, what would you think of an aspect of the Swiss system where I believe if you can get together a petition of 100,000 votes, you then force a referendum? Referendums are dangerous, though, um, uh, because um, you know it's. Uh, I'm I'm not in favour of referendums. I think that I certainly understand why they happen. Right in in that in that um, um, there must always be some kind of mechanism uh, where people are able to, um, um, you know, uh, mobilise and make those kinds of demands. Um, but I am, but I'm, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that could work um, in our context now. I'm not sure. Yeah.
but I don't like referendums so though. I think that they can be manipulated very, very easily. Um, yeah, but this, this is me. Uh, I guess so. But maybe it could be just in an advisory capacity, the referendum that is, and not in a legally enforceable manner. For sure. Yeah, for sure. No, for sure. Definitely. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I mean, but for me, though, I think that, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, where, where we agree, though, is that, the, is that we're at a point where the system needs some kind of reform. Um, what it looks like, I think nobody is quite sure, but they, but, but yeah, but we've reached a point where that, for me, is something that is, um, that has to happen. Yeah. Okay. Are you in favor of the Fonzel Sabbat recommendations? Um, look. I ideally would favor any system that tries to think through elections in a kind of creative way. Um, and so the, so, so the answer is yes. Um, and I think that, in fact, he's, he uh, started a conversation um, that should never have been parked, in fact. Um, um, and that, in fact, had the kind of foresight um, that many people didn't have then, you know, to sort of say that actually, in fact, you know what, we have to look into the, you know, uh, look into the, uh, uh, you know, future in the sense that um, even though the PR system, you know, means that, you know, everybody gets, uh, you know, some say there are the kind of flaws in it that could put us in a very, very bad, bad place. And that's where we live today. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. thank you, everybody, for your question. That was quite a full hour of question and answer that must have been exhausting for you, Zvaletu. Thank you very, thank you very much, much for.